question for you, because we're just kind of warming up a little bit. How many of you have ever been to an uncomfortable dinner party? Show of hands. Let me tell you about one, okay? So I'm going to I'm going to change the location. I'm going to not use any names just to protect the innocent. It, it was years ago. I mean, before I've ever met any of you, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, this may or may not have been a Thanksgiving party with my squadron mates, and so it's all these company grade officers, captains, and lieutenants sitting around this table, and. Melly and I had been married for less than a year. And very innocently, we ask, so how did everybody meet? And there's all these snickers all over the table. And we're like, uh-oh, I think we just stepped in something. A man who had the spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice, Ha, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him, having done him no harm. And they were all amazed and said to one another, What is this word? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. The second one I'd like to read for you is Luke chapter 6, verses 6 through 11. So that first one, when Jesus uh, healed man with the unclean spirit, it was the first healing that he performed on a Sabbath. Here's another one. On another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching, and a man was there whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might find a reason to accuse him. But he knew their thoughts, and he said to the man with the withered hand, Come and stand here. And he rose and stood there. And then Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save a life or destroy it? And after looking around at them all, he said to him, Stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored. But they were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. So you can see we're building a case here. What's going on on the Sabbath is Jesus heals people on the Sabbath. The last one, Luke chapter 13, verses 10 through 17. So 13, verse, starting with verse 10. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your disability. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight, and she glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, There are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. When the Lord answered him, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, who Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? As he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame, and all the people rejoiced at all the glorious things that were done by him. All right, so we have now before us four accounts of Jesus healing on the Sabbath. So the first one, he healed a demon-possessed man. It was the first time that Jesus healed on the Sabbath. I mentioned that. Second time, he healed a man with a withered hand. And it's an episode that, this, that, that um, illustrates the growing rift between the Pharisees and Jesus. They watched him. And that's not a nice watching. That's a sinister, lurking kind of watching. Uh, they were filled with fury. Can you imagine? Like, this guy's got this scribbled hand. and You know, like... Like, imagine, I mean, you guys, some of you know Bob Dole. Bob Dole was injured in the war. He had a hand that was disabled. Imagine the Lord saying, stretch out your hand, and Bob Dole was able to do that. That would be amazing. I mean, the guy had a, a hand that was damaged since the, he was a young man in the war. That's miraculous. Can you imagine being filled with fury over that? But the Pharisees were. They were filled with fury, and moreover, they conspired with one another to see what they might do to him. And then the third one that we talked about was the woman with the disabling spirit. She was bent over for years. But the synagogue leader was indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. Now, okay, so what's going on here? Like, he's talking about six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed, now on a Sabbath day. And what he's standing on 
is Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But on the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, or your male servant, your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For six days, for in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Okay, so it sounds like he's standing on good ground, right? But why the Sabbath? Why the Sabbath? Why do you suppose the Sabbath is holy? What is that really about? Anybody? John? Rest. Rest. Okay, so we got rest. It's set apart from all the regular things done. Right? Okay, so it's set apart from regular stuff. So if you were agrarian and you were subsistence farming, Taking a day off requires a lot of what? Preparation? Faith. Faith. It takes a lot of faith when you're just getting by. You know, if I could just go out and milk Bessie one more time, if I could put another row of corn in, right? It takes a lot of faith. So the Lord answered in the, in the um, situation with the woman who was bent over, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? And that was the normal practice. The rabbis and the Pharisees especially were concerned for their livestock. I mean, it was their livelihoods. It only makes sense. You're not going to make your, your animals suffer, not water them all day. Like, they, like you're responsible for them. It would be like keeping your dog kenneled up and not giving them new water because it's work. No. I mean, you feed yourself on the Sabbath. You still change your child's diapers. It, it's in that category, right? Deuteronomy 22.4 says, You shall not see your brother's donkey or his ox fallen down by the way and ignore them. You shall help them to lift them up again. So this is in the section of the law in Deuteronomy. It's, the many Bibles, uh, the header is other laws. And it's talking about how to exercise brotherly love for one another. Loving one another doesn't go away on a Sabbath. The regular stuff is supposed to. And it's an opportunity for us to trust the Lord, to have faith. So Jesus says, Ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, who Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? And what happened to his adversaries? They were put to shame. And they should have been. They missed the forest for the trees, they missed the big picture. They were more concerned about the tiny little things and they missed how to show compassion for somebody in their midst. That and the fact that they, had already cons they were already mad. They were already conspiring. They were already trying to get one over on Jesus. Jesus is showing that compassion is what God wants, not self-centeredness. Yes, ma'am. Is that why they were angry? Because he was constantly showing people how they didn't have a right? I guess I don't understand anger. I keep thinking like, that was something amazing that he did. And I guess, what was their problem, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Well, that, that's, a, that's a great question, and it leads right into what we're going to talk about right now. So the Pharisees, as a group, not every single Pharisee was horrible, just like not everybody that lived in the Third Reich was evil. There were some very evil people, and there were some people who just caught up in it. Not every Pharisee individually was evil, but as a group, these guys were not so awesome. So who were they? The Pharisees rose up during the intertestamental period. So between the, the, the last of the prophets that talked and John the Baptist, that 400 years of silence, that's when the Pharisees rose up. They saw the moral decline of their nation. Okay. But so far, so good. I, you see the moral decline. Let's turn back to following the law of the Lord. Okay, that's, that's good too. Um, they were known as the set-apart ones because they set themselves apart. Okay, well, I'm starting to see some sinister foreshadowing of some groups that exist here in the modern world that some of us have had to fight against. Um, some were apparently convinced, some Pharisees were apparently convinced, that if just one of them kept the law perfectly for one day, that that would induce God to send the Messiah. Let me say that one more time. Some of them were convinced that if just one of them kept the law perfectly, that it would induce God to send the Messiah. 
Do you see how messed up that theology is? <laughs> like, first, keeping the law perfectly, all right, so we got some issues there. And then that it would induce the Lord to do anything. Where did they miss who the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was? That's, there's the fundamental problem there. There's a problem of unbelief in the Pharisaical party. So, ironically, this group had the Messiah standing right in front of them. But as a group, they had degenerated into a bunch of hypocrites. They wanted to parade their righteousness before men rather than parade righteousness before God. They wanted to demonstrate to men how righteous they were. They didn't care about trying to demonstrate righteousness before God. What is self-righteousness, by the way? Let's have a little bit of interaction here. What's self-righteousness? Anybody? I'm perfect and you're not? Okay. Anybody else? Idolatry. Idolatry. How is that idolatry? It's, it's ultimately trust in yourself. Yeah. Versus trust in God. I'm good enough. Yeah. But also setting yourself up as a moral standard for others. Setting yourself as a moral standard for others. Good. <laughs> good. So, rugged American individual. Look, where are my boots? Pull myself on my bootstraps. That could turn into a form of self-righteous idolatry, couldn't it? That I can do it on my own. I mean, that kind of tweaks you a little bit because, I mean, that, that's part of our national character. You know, I'm a rugged individualist. I can take care of it. I can take care of myself. Um, these guys were even worse. It was, it was, I'm going to follow the law and almost to this idea that perhaps God owes me. That's, again, bad, bad theology. So, um, that's who the Pharisees were as a party. So, as we look at our passage today, uh, Luke 14, 1 through 14, the first verse is the setup. So, um, we have uh, one Sabbath, when he went in to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. So, so one Sabbath, okay, we know the time. We don't know what time of year or even where, but we know it's on a Sabbath. We know it's a ruler of the Pharisees. We talked a little bit about the Pharisees. Uh, ruler could be like, um, the synagogue ruler could even be a member of the Sanhedrin. Uh, the they, in the, they were watching him, it's the rest of the Pharisees, and watching carefully. So we saw this in one of our other passages. Uh, quite literally in the Greek, to be on the lookout or to pay attention to. Um, could be translated to lurk or to spy here in this context. So they were lurking. They were watching expectantly for Jesus to trip up. I mean, you could just, you could almost feel the schadenfreude. So we, we talked about schadenfreude on, I don't remember, it was Friday night, I think. Uh, schadenfreude is uh, happiness at somebody else's misfortune. Okay? So these guys were anticipating a little bit of schadenfreude. They, they wanted to to experience happiness at Jesus' misfortune when he broke the law. It's ironic. So they were watching carefully. Um, so that's the setup. So let's zoom back out a little bit, and, and we're focusing back on our passage here, Luke 14, 1 through 14. So what's the, what's the overall structure, right? Um, so the way, you can, you can do this a lot of different ways, but I see two things. Um, I see, uh, first, God's law mercy or Sabbath observance. So there's, there's a section that deals with that. And then second, there's a section that deals with humility. So there's this thing going on at the beginning and then some Jesus teaching that, that talks about humility after that. And the section that deals with mercy or Sabbath observance, uh, you could kind of break that into four pieces. The setting, the setup, the silencing, and the story. Credit to MacArthur for that. I didn't come up with the four S's, but you know, it sounded pretty cool. Uh, and then the way you could break down the humility piece is seating at a wedding feast, uh, throwing a party, and then a glimpse at what's next. So that's one way to outline this. That's how I chose to outline it. So we already talked about the setting. So let's talk about the setup. Um, and behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. Okay, what's dropsy? It's edema. Edema is swelling of the extremities. Um, according to Cambridge, uh, 
Since the mid-19th century, dropsy or edema has been recognized as a sign of underlying diseases of the heart, liver, kidneys, or malnutrition. Untreated dropsy was eventually always fatal. So the prevailing opinion at the time of the Pharisees and Jesus would have been uh, that the disease or deformity was a result of God's punishment. In this case, dropsy most likely for some sort of unrighteous sexual activity, some sort of sexual immorality. He would have been ritually unclean. So why is a dude with dropsy at a Pharisee ruler's house? That does not make sense. He would not have been allowed there. Even though uninvited guests were often found at dinner parties. It's a setup. Yes, Bob is whispering to me, it's a setup. Absolutely, it's a setup. That's why he's there. We've seen this. Well, we'll see it again. Uh, they had this guy show up. Maybe, maybe he could have worked his way in. The text doesn't tell us that the, absolutely the Pharisees brought this guy in. But it seems likely, and I'm going to tell you why it seems likely. Um, so this ritually unclean man is there. And, I mean, think about this. Think about the humiliation, right? Think about how he's just being used. And think about the depravity of the Pharisees. And, and if it sounds like I'm hammering these guys, well, I am. Because Luke hammers them. All right? So I'm, I'm not, like, just making it up. Luke hammers the Pharisees because they're to be seen as a negative example. So if you hear Pharisee and think Taliban, you're not wrong. I mean, you're, you're really not. They killed Jesus. They got to their heads that it would be better to just kill this guy and ignore all the signs that he's doing. We're going we're gonna to blame the devil on the miracles that he's working. Okay? So, Luke's hammering the Pharisees, so am I. There's this poor guy who's suffering from a disease that will be fatal. He's there. Verse 3, And Jesus responded to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, it is, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? What was Jesus responding to? Is there a real intention behind the question? The real intention behind the question, right. Did anybody ask him a question? No. So he was responding to something could be just the action, Allison, or it could be he was reading their minds. The text doesn't tell us that, but he's responding to something. The text does tell us that, that Jesus is responding, and we know there were no questions uttered. So he's answering a question or perhaps even the thoughts of his enemies. Bottom line, Jesus sees the setup. The gig is up. He's not surprised. We're not surprised either. And he places the Pharisees squarely on the horns of a dilemma. What's it mean to be on the horns of a dilemma? Have you ever been on the horns of a dilemma? You could go one way or the other, and either way, it's pretty miserable because you're on the horns, right? You're going to get stuck. One way. You're going to get on a left horn or a right horn. Either way, you're getting stuck, right? So in this case, what is the horns of the dilemma? To say that the healing on the Sabbath was legal would make them look soft on the law to others. In the eyes of men, they would look soft on the law. But to say the healing on Sabbath was illegal it would make them look indifferent to human suffering to the people. Again, in the eyes of man, they would have looked indifferent to human suffering. Think about that. The horns of the Pharisees' dilemma was self-made because they cared about what other people think. In the eyes of men, they would have been soft on the law or indifferent to human suffering. But either way, it was about in the eyes of men. You see what a problem it is when you worry about yourself in the eyes of others? When you compare yourself to others? The Pharisees are trapped, and Jesus knows it, and Jesus puts them squarely on the horns of the dilemma. They can't answer the question because to answer one way or the other, they're stuck. They look bad in front of the people, and that, brothers and sisters, is the worst thing for the Pharisees, to look bad in front of others because it's all about status. It's all about standing. They've missed the boat. It's not about righteousness before God anymore. It's about your, your standing because somehow they got it twisted in their mind that their social status somehow equated whether or not God was pleased with them. But they're trying to do it all on their own. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? We do that sometimes. I've done that. I do that. But the Pharisees wisely remained silent. Then he took him and healed him and sent him away. So again, because the Pharisees cared so much for how they appeared before men, they remained silent. Interestingly, these men who had such high regard for the law were trying to get Jesus to break the law by doing a miracle to get rid of him. Let me say that again. 
high regard for law. That's the Pharisees. But they were trying to trick Jesus into breaking the law by doing a miracle so that they could get rid of him. Isn't that messed up? I mean, you see how twisted it is? But that's how hard their hearts were. It's no wonder that Luke sets them up as the negative example. And we're not going to get let off the hook any more than the Pharisees are because our hearts are hard too. The Israelites' hearts are hard. It's not just like the Pharisees are the only people who sin. So don't misunderstand me. But they are the negative example here. So Jesus took, i.e. he seized him. That, that is how you could read this. He quite literally took charge of the situation. He took the man with dropsy and he healed him and sent them away. Isn't that just like our Savior? To take over the situation? Isn't that just like God? To enfold all the evil that people are trying to do and turn it into something good, something they meant for evil, turn it into something good for this man who was suffering from his horrible disease. Jesus heals him and then spares him further in dignity and sends him away. Like he doesn't have to sit there and be a pawn anymore. He's not going to just sit there and be abused by these guys who thought they were better than him. Jesus takes care of the entire situation from start to finish. Jesus heals him and then sends him away, removes him from the situation. And there's irony here as well. It's deep. Jesus saves a man that was literally drowning in his own bodily fluids. But the Pharisees stubbornly refuse Jesus' attempts to rescue them from their drowning in their own self-righteousness. Again, credit to Johnny Mac. I didn't, I, I didn't come up with that. That was pretty awesome. But I had to quote it. I mean, it, that was, that's pretty good. Because the Pharisees, they really are. They're dry, drowning in their own self-righteousness. So the irony is deep. So this isn't Jesus' mic drop moment. Like he could have just been like, you guys, step off. I'm out, you know. But he doesn't. He graciously begins to teach them, even if their hearts are hard, and even if they won't listen to him. Jesus is going to teach them anyway. And he said to them, which of you having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day will not immediately pull him out? Jesus knows full well that the Pharisees were concerned for the welfare of their livestock. Um, in fact, some translations, we even replace son here in our ESV with donkey, so donkey or ox. Um, but again, they couldn't reply to these things. And then Jesus goes further. Now he told a parable to those who were invited. When he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying, uh, saying to them. So he's going to start talking to them. So they, they, put, they, they picked places of honor. So what's that all about? Picking places of honor and everything. Think about the Pharisees again. Think about what they were all about. They were about that social standing and saving face and who comes before who and precedence and everything. Some of us who have had some time in the military, we, we, you might remember like order of precedence and ceremonies and stuff like that. Like every, everybody knows in the United States, the U.S. flag always goes first in the procession. When there's a parade, everybody's flag dips except for the U.S. flag. And I've gotten in huge, huge trouble because I had the U.S. flag and I refused to salute it towards somebody else's colors and the French guys got really, really mad at me. And I'm like, sorry, get over it. It's the United States. I'm not saluting my flag to you. Everybody else saluted. I mean, we were, everybody else that was with me saluted, but I didn't. So that's precedence, all right? So that's big picture. Now let's zip, zoom in a little bit. About standing and pecking orders. How do we do this today? What are some examples of status today? Anybody? When my family's over, I have a chair. Ah. And nobody sits in. Okay, all right. So there's a special chair. All right. Good. Okay, so there's, there's a positive example of status in, in showing honor. So the way that uh, in Kayla's house that honor is shown is when, there's, when they have guests, the children move around so the guests can have a real bedroom and the kids will sleep on a couch or something like that. Let's think of some others. Terry. scary 
Okay, so they, sometimes people feel some intimidation around the pastures. I don't want to pray around them, or they're somehow set apart, or something like that. Okay, so let's let's narrow our focus down to some ways that we ourselves display our own status. Um, I'll hit you my punchline because I had this saved for last. So talking to youth, um, I always tell them, you didn't accidentally put the clothes you're wearing on. You made a conscious choice. Now, the choice could have been as simple as it was the only thing that was clean or it was the only thing that didn't smell as bad as everything else. I get that. But in general, for our youth, what's going on is they're making a conscious decision about what to wear because they want to project something to the people who see them. Something they feel about themselves or something they want to communicate to others. In general. Not always, but in general. And we do that too. And we do that in a multitude of ways. Um, and we enjoy some of the status that we get, and, and it can go to our heads. Like, for instance, being able to fly first class on an airplane, or being able to get into the airport club so you don't have to sit with the masses. Um, a skybox at a football game or a baseball game. Uh, courtside seats at NBA games. You go sit next to Spike Lee, right? Uh, infield parking at a NASCAR race could be a different kind of status. A special spot at a tailgate for a football game. Living in certain neighborhoods. Driving a luxury car. Certain clothes. I mean, the amount some people pay for jeans. These are Old Navy on sale. I think Melanie got like, I think they paid her to buy the jeans for me. <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's pretty awesome at getting discounts. But... You know, what, Lucky? Lucky's a jean brand, right? I think they're, like, super expensive. Um, phones. Uh, you, know, you can get a diamond-encrusted iPhone. I don't know why, but you could. Uh, vacations. You know, we're going to go to Cabo on vacation. So those are ways of communicating your status, like time now, current day. Like, it probably is weird to us that you would jockey for a position at a table, but is it weird? I mean, isn't it, doesn't it give you like shades of like the breakfast club or, uh, you know, some kind of wonderful or, or clueless, like those old movies, right? Where you have the high school hierarchy and you can sit at this table, not that table. You can sit with the jocks, you can sit with the popular kids or whatever. I mean, that's status too. And that's what the Pharisees were doing. They were engaged in a sophomore, like a high school type battle for status. Who got to sit where? Because the way that a feast would be set up, you'd have these three-person couches, and they would be set up in a U. Couch number one would have the host, and on his left or right would be the guest of honor. And couch number two would be the next lowest in status, and couch number three, positions uh, seven, eight, nine, nine being the lowest, is where the lowest guy would sit. And so what Jesus is talking about when he told them, told them to, uh, when you're invited by a wedding feast, don't sit down at the left or right of the host. Go down to position number nine, and he can bring you up. Now it sounds like it's some sort of like crazy self-help stuff, right? Um, but this isn't necessarily something right out of how to win friends and influence people. I mean, it's, it's not that kind of advice because what Jesus really probably has in view is true humility. It's a disposition that counts others as more significant than oneself is what Jesus is after. Yes, there is the practical outworking of that. Um, it was my habit when I was active duty and I, I was working for a, a senior leader, that if I went to a meeting, I would sit in the worst seat in the room. And I would often get moved. But I would never presume to go sit at the table because sitting at the table meant you were somebody and you got to say something. I didn't have a speaking role and I was not allowed to make decisions. It was not my job. I was there to bring the coffee and take notes. And I knew it. I understood what my position was. Now, sometimes as a contractor, I have to force my government guys to sit where they're supposed to sit. And I don't mean like sit lower, like they refuse to sit up at the table. It's like, yo, dude, I need you to make decisions. Sit up at the table. You need to speak. So it goes back both ways. But here, what Jesus is talking about is humility. Philippians 2.3 says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. So when you sit at the other place, the lower place, you are counting somebody else as more significant than yourself. When you offer your spot to somebody who visits, you're practicing the habit of counting somebody else as more significant than yourself. 
Because after all, we should be like with Paul. I'm the worst of all sinners. I know what I've done. I know what I've been forgiven. I know what I deserve to happen to me. And thanks be to God, it's not going to you. But I know where I came from. Far be it for me to put myself above somebody else. But that was not currently in the Pharisees' lexicon. They didn't understand that. Jesus told them, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. James echoes this in four, James 4, 6. But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. 1 Peter 5, 5. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Ultimately, humbling oneself in repentance will lead to the ultimate exalta uh, exaltation of eternal life with the Father. Think about that. If you understand who the Father is and who you are in relation to him, you can't help but be humbled. You know what your position is in the face of Almighty God. How, how could you not? If you really understand. So... The Pharisees' sin of pride was really a sin of unbelief because they didn't believe that God was really who he said he was. They thought they were better than they really were. And how often do we fall into that as well? The sin of pride that really is the sin of unbelief, thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought or thinking more lowly of God than we should. They didn't believe Jesus even when they saw him face to face, and they saw him do things that only God can do. Instead of responding in faith, they accused him of getting his power from the devil. And brothers and sisters, when we refuse to believe God and take him at his word, and we refuse to believe what scripture says about God, what God says about himself, we're doing the same thing. We're basically saying all this creation that you did, you did out of the devil. I mean, we're just right there with the Pharisees when we commit that sin. That's why they're a negative example. Jesus doesn't just teach the guys who showed up at the Pharisee ruler's house. He also teaches the host as well. And he said to the man who invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and be, you re, be repaid. So there's nothing wrong with having a party with your friends. I mean, there's, there's not. So don't read into this that we have to have this doctrine now of, you can't invite your friends. You can't have your family over. There's nothing wrong with that. But when you have your friends over, the general social interaction is like, you know, I have you over, and then you're going to have me over, or I ask you out to dinner, and you ask me out to dinner, and so on and so forth. Not always, but that's it's kind of how it works. And then, like, when your kids are a little bit older, like, you do Christmas, they do Easter, and then somebody else does Thanksgiving, you kind of move it around. That's, that's kind of what happens when they're a little bit older, when they're not like dirt poor out in college, right? Um, but what Jesus is saying is when you invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, people who cannot repay their hosts, it's an act of pure gener generosity. So Jesus is telling his host, yo, man, instead of like inviting me here with all your like rich friends to try to show me up, Maybe you should have like thrown a party for a bunch of people like the guy that you had here to use, the guy with dropsy. I mean, Jesus totally turns the tables again. Yeah, and I mean, and we, something in us likes it when those tables get turned, right? Like the old 80s movies often had that, that the one who was getting used becomes the hero and you know, the, the one that was doing the using gets their just desserts and all that kind of stuff. Jesus is doing the same thing here. He's telling the host, hey, you shouldn't have used the guy with dropsy to try to harm me. You should have invited him and a bunch of his friends and given them a, a party out of pure generosity because the Lord has blessed you with much. And Jesus goes further and says, this kind of thing will be recognized at the resurrection of the just. So I'm not going to spin off in that direction for too long. I'm just simply going to say that Jesus had a definitive statement about life after death. There is a resurrection, and there is a reward, period, full stop. So there is a resurrection, there is a reward, and he and the Pharisees would have agreed about that. But how to get there, they would have disagreed about quite a bit. 
Jesus is talking about one whose heart would generous, would, would give a party out of it in, in an act of pure generosity is one who would be recognized at the resurrection. So what Jesus is doing by teaching about mercy and humility is to graciously show how the Pharisees are falling short and they're in need of salvation. Humbly received, Jesus is worshiping repentance and a cry for help. So here's a little more audience interaction. Brothers and sisters, do we see ourselves in the Pharisees? Have you ever been tempted to try to maneuver somebody into doing something wrong so you could, like, like are, are, even if you don't do it yourself, are you tempted to watch carefully our leaders to wait for them to slip up? Do you eagerly check your phone for the latest gaffe from so-and-so? And do you receive it with glee? In what ways do we do things in reciprocal fashion? In what ways do we invite certain people to enhance our own social status? Do we care too much about how we display our status? Do we make much of our degrees or our achievements or what our kids are doing or what kind of car we drive or how much we make? Or we really count others as more significant than ourselves? Do we really put others first? Do we really believe that true Sabbath keeping is being compassionate towards those around us? Because that's what Jesus was teaching. Jesus was teaching that how could you ignore somebody who's all bound up and how would you get mad at me for healing them on the day of rest? It's not work to be compassionate. Yes, ma'am. Have you ever heard the song The 21st Time by, I think it's Monk and Nagel? Have you heard that song? I can't say that I have. Well, the basic gist of the song is he's talking about these people that he sees. Like, one of them is a homeless veteran. One of them is a mother who has a bunch of kids at home and who's trying to fight. So the point is basically he's saying, I pretend not to see them sometimes. Mm -hmm. But if I'm following Jesus... I will look for him in them and try to reflect him to people I maybe wouldn't have seen before because that's what he's calling me to do. Okay, I get it. So what Allison is saying, she's talking about a song by Monk and Nagel. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and the idea is that if you see like a homeless veteran or, or various people throughout your day, you kind of like look past them, right? And I think you've all been there. You've either been the person who's been looked past or you've looked past somebody. And the reality is in the, in the song is, that you actually see them and that you respond to them the way that Jesus would. And you see Jesus in them and you see and you act toward them the way that Jesus would. You know, I have this great line, because um, I am the body, like the body of Christ. I'm mm -hmm. thankful that I was forgiven for the 21st time. Mm. So the line in there is, I, I'm part of the body and I'm grateful that I'm part of the body that I was forgiven for the 21st time. So that's awesome. Thank you very much. So I ask you, brothers and sisters, do you recognize you've been forgiven for the 21st or the 700th, 70 times 70th time? Do you recognize the gift that you've been given through Jesus' death and resurrection? Do you understand how Jesus has turned things just a little bit? He's, you know, we're not teaching here to not practice Sabbath, to not rest, and to not to keep the Lord's day holy. Absolutely, we're here. But if Sabbath keeping somehow becomes an either or with showing compassion, I think we've got a problem. And compassion should be part of your, like, just breathing, right? Just and think about your context. In the context of your marriage, in the context of your family, your circle of friends, your extended family, your coworkers, the people you go to church with and go to care group and, and do everything with. So, the question I leave you with is, and I asked you already, 
do you see yourself in the Pharisees? How, how can you be Pharisaical and how can you change that over the course of the next couple of weeks? How can you put what Jesus had for them to work where you would see somebody in need and you would address that need and where you wouldn't jockey for position and where you would show generosity to those who can never hope to repay you. There's three big things right there. They're very practical ways to be not like the negative example of the Pharisees that Luke gives us. So, I have two minutes left. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, you, you say, do, do I see the Pharisees? I, mean, uh, I can, you know, linking this over to uh, Luke 22, uh, I can actually just say, I see myself in the disciples as they had that, you know, a very similar kind of discussion is who is the greatest in the mm-hmm. kingdom. And I think as I'm trying to just link some of these things together, is at the end of this, Jesus says, <clears throat> you know, I don't come to you as uh, you know, one who is intending to be served. I am among you as the one who serves. And just, you know, just thinking through uh, you know, how I, I can have that <clears throat> my faith increased that, that I don't have to jockey for the favor and more excitement. But, but, but he comes as one who serves. He's Lord of the Sabbath, and he is the one who's appointed a place for me. He says he's appointed a place for us at his table. And, and all those other things that pale in comparison to that. And we, uh, it should increase our faith that 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 final reward is, is ours. We don't have to jockey for the, for the rest of the, the temporal kind of jockey that we're talking about. Amen. Amen. Just to sum up what Sam said is, uh, the Lord comes to serve, not to be served. And he is Lord of the Sabbath and servant. And uh, his Father has appointed to each of us a place at his own table. Uh, so we don't have to jockey for position. It's already taken care of, and we should follow Jesus' example and be servants rather than waiting to be served. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. I remember when our kids were little, um, I had there was a tension between um, like wanting to love the lowly and at the same time protect my little girls. Right? So if I saw homeless people um, and I had my little girls in tow, we're not approaching the homeless man. Or even me as a woman, I'm not approaching the homeless man. And so I think there's like a, a, a little bit of a tension of we, we, want, to, we want to obey the Lord and, and love people who are desperate, right? Like the crazy alcoholic neighbor. But at the same time, we we have this protection of our children. And so I think it's it's hard to um, exercise some of these principles um, as we would as we would want to as parents. And so I remember praying that God would give me solutions for how to demonstrate in front of the kids loving the lowly and at the same time protecting. So like you know, I remember one time just crying that God gave me the idea, well, go through the drive through for the homeless guy with the kids in tow so that you can demonstrate loving somebody and simultaneously protecting. But I didn't do it often because it takes effort and it, it takes, like, you got to have, like, you got to be praying about how to love people and, um, like, thinking broader about Lord, what is your will here? And not being myopic on how am I protecting my kids? So it, it's hard to do. It's, it's, um, it's hard to implement, I guess is what I'm saying. And I feel, like, um, I feel like we should be prayerful about the Lord showing us how to implement some of these concepts because otherwise they just float right by and we, we don't really embrace them. That's right. a, a great word. So Melanie's Kind of, again, trying to sum up succinctly. Uh, first, point out the tension. So, um, if you're a lone woman, 
going up to a homeless man, that, that could be dangerous. And so there's tension there. And then if you're a young mom by yourself with some little kids, again, walking up to somebody who's bigger than you on the street or something like that, there could be danger in that, very real physical danger. So there's some tension about, well, how do I show love to somebody who can never repay me, but at the same time, keep all of us safe, right? Because the, the reality is, if he were to do something to you or threaten you, I mean, he could get hurt too, right? It's, it's for both of your safety. Um, so how to do that? So like driving through a drive through and then handing something to him. So you know, just like typically don't give homeless people money because often it'd be used for drugs. You give them food instead or try to direct them towards some place that can help them get uh, safe shelter, safety, right? Um, so there, the, what it really comes down to is the intentionality and praying about, well, how can this work out? Lord, give me wisdom and lead me in how to do this. And, and what Melanie didn't say, I'm going, to, I'm going to pile on, that often, that intentionality will often run headlong into probably the biggest idol in the United States. And it's not football, it's not money, it's time. To do some of this stuff means you've got to give up your time. And I stand convicted in front of all of you. I hate wasting time. Take my money, take my stuff, but man, don't take my time. It takes time to be intentional, to go out of your way, to do X, Y, or Z. So that's where this, so don't be like me and spin in this like, oh, I should do more, when in reality, it's the sacrifice you have to make is a sacrifice of your time. Because many of us do have some resources and we do have some ways to do it. Kayla. I, I have the same thought and maybe what we should think about, maybe the way we should think about it a little bit, bit differently is how we use our time. Are we using our time for others or are we using it for ourselves? Yeah. So Kayla's question, it, the rhetorical question is, think about how are you using your time? Are you using it for yourself? Or are you using it for others? And with that, I'm going to get off the stage. Thank you guys for your participation this morning. Um, Sam, would you mind closing us up? Sure. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, Lord, without your word, we would simply be left in darkness. And so we thank you for the light that your word brings, that informs our minds and our hearts. And Lord, uh, directs them from uh, simply an inward focus. And Lord, draws our thoughts uh, to thoughts of you and your greatness that you have provided us provided us a great Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us uh, continue to, to ponder these things and be amazed by them, even as we uh, prepare our hearts for further worship this morning. Amen.